Okay, so um, I've been thinking a lot about the class. I know a lot of people are behind. Um, so I'm, I've decided this class, I'm gonna streamline the process again, right? I streamlined it before by having a summary of the class and you could post that. Now I've streamlined it again. So um, I just want you, those of you who are behind to catch up, but I do not want you to go to a YouTube video to catch up. Just answer a question, get it done with, move to the next thing. Yeah, I think some of you are taking eight hours, 10 hours. It's a waste of time and it increases a lot of anxiety. So I do want you to respond to the material for each day, but I don't want you to spend a lot of time. So that's what we're going to do today. So first thing is please contact me via email within half an hour of the end of the class to let me know why you didn't come. Unless, of course, your electricity's down and you can't. But I'm supposed to record if it's an excused absence or unexcused. Anything you say, sickness, electricity, totally excused. I'm not picky. Um, in general, I just give everybody unexcused. But I think it's fair to try and be accurate. So that's what I would ask you to do. Let me know if you know you're not going to make it to class, um, whatever. OK, second point. Professor, yeah. I have a question. So during class, if we get disconnected uh, due to electricity or Wi-Fi connection, so do you need to let you again throw email? If you got disconnected, yeah, you should contact me via email. Yeah. Because professor, like in the area we are living, it's continuously like in frequently coming and going. Oh, no, once you get there, once you're in the class and I see you, I assume that the reason that you're, you know, you go out is because of an internet, right? Oh, professor. Okay, here's the other new development. Um, I am going to ask you at the beginning of every class to tell me your reaction to the reading. And if you have not read it, you then you must disconnect and go read it and come back when you're finished reading it to give a reaction because I am not gonna tolerate not being prepared anymore because then you have to go back and redo everything. So I think I can cut out four hours or more of your having to redo posts if I just absolutely demand that you come prepared. If you come having read it and writing some reactions, I'll give you time in class to write more reactions. Then students talk about their reactions. I'll give you time in class to write down your reaction to their reactions, right? That's two thirds of the post you will have finished by the end of the class. Then I will try to let you out early, although not today because I have to, I'm gonna make up a lot of stuff. If I let you out a half an hour early, you must, you must write your reflection immediately and post it. So the total amount you will spend on a class will be 15 pages of reading before the class. I'll just say an hour and a half max, right? I think you can read 10 pages an hour. So it's 1.5 hours before class, 
three hours max of class, 30 minutes after class. That's a total. Uh, and then every month you have a paper. The paper should take four hours. That's eight classes. So that's about 30 minutes more per class. That means you have two and a half hours of homework for a three hour class, which is less than one hour per hour of class. The standard amount is two hours per hour of class. Okay, that's what I want you to do. I'm going to start insisting that you hand it in a week after the class, unless you had, you got sick, you had internet, and then all I want you to do is write that on the post, okay, at the beginning. Because now I have students who are all stressed out, right? They have to scroll back to a month ago. They have to look over all those documents. They have to spend three hours on a YouTube. You know, it takes them five more hours or more. And so that has to stop, right? So we're gonna try to stop it right now. Um, so this is how I'm gonna try to change it up. Um, all right, so I typed up a series of questions. Okay, your first paper was supposed to be about the legacy of the Western Enlightenment for developing nations in terms of the environment. Can everybody see this? Yes, Professor. Okay. Is it big enough? Yes. Okay. So, Here's the first question. I am going to give you time to write on this, okay? In class. So that by the end of this class, please get out a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen. By the end of this class, you can post what you wrote about this, or you can use it for your outline for your first paper or both as far as I'm concerned, but I'm letting you do your homework in class because don't go back and look at YouTube stuff. Just get this stuff done. Okay, so first question, Francis Bacon's big thing, the purpose of scientific knowledge is to apply it to industry and technology. And the purpose of all that is to gain power over nature for human well-being. Okay, to what extent have your countries been affected by this philosophy and this behavior? I mean, there's so many examples, right? In what ways is your nation benefiting from science, industry, and technology? because they are the cause of your development? And to what extent are your nations being harmed when rich nations come in with their science and their industry and their technology and they exploit your natural resources and your people? They you know, pay very little for hiring them to do jobs. To what extent have your land and resources been colonized? And to what extent have your cultures and the minds of your people been colonized? So, so your people just accept it. Okay, so I'm gonna give you time to write on that. And I'm going, when you are done, go to the chat and say done. And I'm gonna be sitting here looking at the chat. And when there get to be about half the students in the class are done, we'll move to the next one. All right, everybody okay with that? I'm giving you time to do your homework. How's that? Done. 
Okay, so start writing on this first question. Can you all see that question or does that little chat box cover up the words? Um, Dr. Beck, do I have to write about it also? You don't have to, Rossi. I just don't know what you're going to do. You could, um, you know, you could study for another class until we get to the point where we're doing the Hinduism and Buddhism, if you want to. Oh, okay, because I'm planning to like do some research on the second paper anyway, so yeah. Okay, just go ahead and do something else. Okay. Can everybody see it? Yes, Professor. Do you see that little chat box that I see? Yes, yes, Professor. We oh, can see. Okay, it. well, then it does cover up the word. So there you go. Okay. Okay, tell me when you're done, just type in done. And then when I get about half the class done, we'll move on. Okay, let me know if you are still furiously writing. Say yes, if you're still furiously writing. Yes, yes. Okay.
There's no word limits. Just use good English, okay? <laughs> Well, I think it's been about 10 minutes, so I will have to stop eventually. But the reason why there's no word limit is because I want you to know environment. Can you give us two more minutes? What? Can you give us two more minutes to finish it up? Well, go ahead, just write while I'm talking, okay? Um, just because everything is connected to everything else. And environmental issues, everything about your life is connected to this, right? The air, the water, the food, everything you see with your eyeballs, it's all connected to this story I'm telling you about development, right? About the science, the scientific era, scientific revolution. So, um, so that's, that's why I don't think this will be hard if you just can get focused on it. Um, and now let me show you what else I've done to make life easier for you at this point and to, um, and to hopefully prevent you from being too anxious, okay? Okay, so what I did, I went back to the second, to the class about Galileo and Bacon and Locke. And I cut out readings you don't need. And this is what I said. Um, first of all, for those of you trying to catch up, and then I just cut and paste that, that question that I just, that you just wrote about, right? So you've just written about this and then you can just post it, right? Or add a little to it. That's it, right? Don't do anything else. Just get the thing done. And you just did it pretty much. And just shape it up, you know, make it into a decent 350 plus word post and post it. Done. Then the next section that I'll give you time to write on is about John Locke because Locke's view of property is so influential also. Both Bacon and Locke, these are major steps in the colonialization, in the scientific revolution, in the exploitation of nature, and then in the way that those movements are impacting developing countries right now. So this is the second question, which I will put on, I'll go back to the um, document I had on before, but if you want to write one post on Bacon because it's so important and another post on Locke, that's fine. And it can be a substitute 
for a post that you haven't gotten done, or it can be extra credit. And I put an assignment uh, way back at the top that says lock extra credit or lock additional, let's see. I can't remember what I called it. Yeah, here it is. Makeup post on lock, right? So if you wanna do that, great. Um, so you can get two posts worth out of this one day's assignment. So I'm gonna give you time to do it right now. So let me go um, to that, the other document so you can see the question better. And I'll give you 10 minutes to write on it and then we'll have to move on. But at least you can feel like, okay, I've written enough. I know enough. I can do this post. No problem. I want you to feel empowered rather than overwhelmed. Okay. So this one, John Locke said, God gave the earth to human beings in common. God wants us to work on the land. And I actually cut out all those original readings because I just want you to focus on the ideas. If you didn't have time to do it, it's over. Just stay focused on this and get it done. Um, work the land, create products that can be used by others, sold on the market, leading to prosperity and a higher standard of living for everyone. No one deserves to inherit land. Only those who work on it and give it value deserve the fruit of their labors. Also, no one, no government can tell people what to do with their land as long as they do what they do leads to products that other people want and buy. No one can tell me not to cut down my, my trees and sell my wood or not to engage in farming on my land, even if it leads to erosion or water pollution or air pollution, it's my property. As long as I create monetary value, I'm doing God's will. Also, since the barter system does not allow people to make a profit and use the extra money to build factories, invest in research, et cetera, this is what's happened since Locke. An economic system based on money is better than a barter system, okay? Locke did not agree with that. Adam Smith was worried about it. Locke wouldn't like the fact that people who get rich and make money can give their money to their children, creating a new wealthy class based on money, not on inherited land but we now have an entrenched wealthy class throughout the world, right? People have decided that it's better to have money so you can invest in factories and new, new products, new um, techniques. To what extent are your nations affected by this philosophy about property and property rights? that was created by John Locke. How are your countries positively affected and how are they negatively affected? To what extent have your own people gained from the increased wealth? And to what extent have the colonizing nations gained more than you have, right? Um, to what extent is a small wealthy class in your countries gained while most people stay poor? To what extent have the land and resources been exploited by colonization? And to what extent have your culture and the minds of your people been colonized or brainwashed by these beliefs and the belief that this will in fact lead to greater prosperity for your people? <laughs> Okay, now that's lots of stuff, but I'm going to give you 10 minutes now, but I want you, I want, you know, that part of your brain to have clicked in 
So as soon as possible, finish up, post it, move on, you know, just forget whatever, you know, I want you to catch up. So I'll give you 10 more, 10 minutes on this. And if you want to just jot notes or just an outline that you can go back to and make a complete post, do it that way. Okay. All right. Now I'll be quiet for 10 minutes. You can also let me know when you're done, just in case everyone finishes before 10 minutes. Um, I'll be right back.
those of you who are listening to this as a YouTube because you couldn't get to class, please stop the tape and do the homework during while you're listening so that you can just get it done <laughs> while your mind is on it. Is anybody done yet? Boy, I'm going to have a lot of reading to do this weekend, which I'm glad about. Okay, I'm giving you two more minutes. So if something's in your mind, just write it as an outline. You probably need to edit the prose anyway. All right. Okay. Next question. Kant. How has Kant's view of reason affected development? And what has its effects been on your countries? Okay, just to remind you, Kant completely separates reason from nature. Reason is built into our brains before we're born. We impose the categories of reason onto the world. That is why we are of infinite worth while the physical world is not. We are justified in using animals and all of the natural world as a means for human well being. This view has led to artificial intelligence, computers, etc. 
It's also led to the belief that the solution to any problems created by reason and science and technology is more reason, science, and technology. To what extent has this belief and people who think this way been coloners of colonizers of your country in the name of development? To what extent have you benefited from more technology? And to what extent have more wealthy and powerful nations come into your countries with their technology and computers and further exploited you? <laughs> All right, and then I'll show you how I did that for the post. Um, all right, I changed the post so that the I cut out a bunch of readings and then I have this exact question. And then I said at the bottom here, you may want to write this post on Kant's view of animal rights. Go ahead. Um, so I have Kant's view, I left the only, documents I left on here was Kant's method of teaching, where you separate a child from all their inclinations and get them to focus on freedom and their goodwill. You don't have to read that over or refer to it, but that just reminds you of what I said. And then there's a short document on Kant on uh, we don't have any direct duties to animals. And then there's an outline of Kant's view. And right after it is an outline of another scholar's view that says it's consistent with environmentalism. You do not have to refer to that at all. You can just ignore it. So if you want to write two different posts, one on Kant's view of reason and the, its effect today in terms of artificial intelligence, computers, and you want to write another post on Kant's view of animal rights. I have included up here um, an opportunity to post an extra credit, right? Now, that could be literally extra credit where you write 15 posts instead of 14, but it could be just a makeup post so that your total by the end of the semester is 14, right? So if you want to do two on Kant, post one of them under Kant and one of them under extra credit. Okay, so now I'll go back. Um, I'll go back to the original document because it's, it, it's clearer, right? The language is bigger. And then I'll give you another 10 minutes, but it's very possible you won't take 10 minutes on this. Just be honest and we can move on. Okay.
Okay, I'm giving you two more minutes. And we'll have to go on. Oh, I think I told you that before. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll do one more before we break. Okay. Next one, utilitarianism. Bentham and Mill thought the pleasure and pain and desire for happiness defined as, sorry, thought we were motivated by pleasure, pain, and the desire for happiness when happiness is defined as maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. We are just sophisticated animals. We think, but ultimately we're motivated by the same pleasures, pains, and fears as animals. So it's exactly the reverse of Kant. To what extent do you think colonizers have come into your nations with this philosophy and made themselves happier and richer by convincing your people that the way they can become happier and have more pleasure and less pain is by buying products made in the colonizing nations. Has your nation and have your people become happier? And do they have lives with more pleasure and less pain because of their consumptions of products made by the developed nations? To what extent do the people in your countries and your country's economy as a whole benefit from consumer products as the path to pleasure and happiness? Okay. Now I'll go back and show you how I revised the, um, the Google Classroom. Okay, I cut out the readings um, and I asked you that question. And then in addition, there is the news article, Mr. Traub, he said that in the case of Americans, our pleasure and happiness is destroying the planet. So I want to, then you can say, is that true of your country? Are your people equally brainwashed or convinced that they, the only way to be happy is consumption and they also are destroying the planet? Okay, you, you don't have to include that in your post, but you might want to. That's why I left it there. It's easy to read. You might want to show how this is the relation between the colonizer nation and the colonized nations. Then I just left out the outlines. Nobody has to go back and reread. No more YouTube videos. And then you might want to write on animal rights right? The capacity to suffer should give people legal protections, should give creatures legal protections. If you want to write on both, again, post the one of them, post the animal rights one on the extra credit, right? Okay, so let me go back to the question here. And I'm sorry that it's the pages are split. So it's a little smaller um, to get it all on. But again, I will give you 10 minutes. And then we will, um, oops, and then we'll break for 10 minutes. And you can write more furiously <laughs> if you want to but I will give you a break for 10 minutes.
Professor. Yes. I have a question. So for giving these reactions to these readings, do you need to do you need secondary articles for that or just in a point no. of view? No, you've, yeah, you've never, I asked you originally to quote briefly from the readings, right? Do you remember that? But, but I cut them out just now, right? Yes, but, but okay. Professor, there are certain questions, right? We need to give the answers. So for that, it's only our views, opinions, but not needed the secondary data, right? You can you can cut and paste from those outlines, right? To support. Your okay. Work. There are some quotes in those outlines, but you don't even need to use quotes. You can just quote from the outlines, right? That's a good question. I just want you to stay focused on the subject. <laughs> um, so I would say, quote, three short quotes from the outlines or from the news article or from the article by Peter Singer, if you're doing animal rights. But that's a good question. Thank you, Professor. <clears throat> OK, um, I'm going to have to say that. Sorry, I'm going to have to say it again. So just ignore me while you're writing, but I need it to say it to the YouTube. OK. If, so originally I asked you to quote three short quotes from the readings in the class on your post. I have eliminated a lot of those readings because I just don't want people to get bogged down. I absolutely want you to finish this up. Feel like you're not overwhelmed, but you need three short quotes just from the outlines. Some of those outlines directly quote the texts of the authors. Others just quote the outline, just some sort of indication that you are reacting to the, the texts and the ideas and the lines of reasoning of the class. That's it. Not going to be picky but I want you to get the main ideas of the class and show me through, through good English that you are getting the main ideas. The other thing is that I don't think you, I don't think for 10 minutes of writing during this class, it will be an A post. So, I do think you're going to, what I want you to do is get down all the main ideas and then if, and then polish it, right? I mean, you can post it right away if you want, depends upon how good your English is. But if you want to take 15 minutes or 20 just to look at the English, right? Nothing else, <laughs> just stay focused and get the thing in. But when I say get it in, you know, it matters if the English is good or not. But don't obsess about that. If your English isn't that good, just get it done and move on. Okay.
Okay, it is now 10, 10 minutes after. And so at 20 after, we'll start again. Um, you can spend the time writing or you can take a break. And I will start again in 10 minutes. We have um, Karl Marx. And then um, that's the main one we have. And then we'll go back to, um, uh, we've done Christianity, Islam, and the assignment for today was Hinduism and Buddhism. And I didn't revise those. Those I still have the same stream and the same um, attachments. But I would say fast forward, you don't need to do the YouTube video. You know, if it doesn't help you, if you can get the concepts yourself, just do it and get it over with and move on. All right.
Okay, we have two minutes. Zoom recording. Is it recording now? Yes, Professor. Has yes. it not been recording in the past? <laughs> it's in recording, Professor. But today's class, I guess, we didn't record. Oh, boy. All right. Okay. So, um, so go ahead and write on marks. And I'll just explain this at the end. Of, well, actually, I'll explain it right now while you're writing on marks. Okay, to the students who are doing the YouTube, I apologize. I thought when it said the screen share was paused, it meant the recording is paused. And when the screen share is resumed, it meant the recording is resumed. So what we're doing with every one of these questions, um, which I have inserted into the stream. So you go to the stream, you write answer to those questions, 350 words or more, forget the YouTube, quote just from those few documents that I have attached, even though they're outlines and get it posted and get it done. So I do say that on the stream. That's what we've been doing throughout this class. I just give students time to do it literally in class to get this over with. Um, I recommend that 10 minutes of free writing is probably not a college level post. So you can revise it. I would recommend that you look over the English, you look over whether it's organized, whether one sentence follows from the other. I would want you to do some paragraphs. A number of posts have no paragraphs when you change your subject. So um, I would say it would take you 15 minutes perhaps to just edit it, clean it up, and then post it and move on. So that's what we're doing. And I'm going to give the students seven more minutes and then we'll move on. But in the chat, if you finish early, let me know. So now I have to find Okay, the next question is, um, is a possible question for paper number one, given all of this, right? Paper number one is on the legacy of Western civilization on colonized countries today. Okay, given all of this, what do you think is the best way forward? Do you think the United Nations has a good model for development? The Declaration of Human Rights, the Capabilities Model, and the other declarations that have been written since then. Okay, so the UN is, has a declaration focused on the right to a clean environment. Um, they have the, um, they're working on a curriculum to educate children um, to respect the natural world and to live in a sustainable way. Um, do you know of NGOs that are doing good work in your nations based on a different philosophy, based on the goal of sustainable development? So what's going on right now is that there's a war between people who have benefited from the old fossil fuel paradigm and people who desperately are trying to change it. And the US is, is controlled, the political system 
is controlled more by fossil fuel billionaires than I think any other country in the world. Because the US partly was taming the frontier. I mean, our whole, so much of our wealth came from cutting down the trees and, and planting, you know, exploiting the natural world in the Northern hemisphere in our country. And we just can't get over it. But developing countries, Europe and Europe, are more aware of this um, because they experience the results more immediately. So I would imagine that in every one of your countries, there's this war going on <laughs> with the old fossil fuel um, leaders, economic and political leaders, and the new sustainability um, movements and political leaders and uh, economic development projects. Um, so you know that in the documents I gave you um, from the beginning, way back at the first on the first day, we had this discussion of paradigm shifts, right? There was the ancient, the modern in the West, the ancient one, the modern one, and now we have to move, right? To a systems thinking, what I call systems thinking, it's just everything is an interconnected system. And so changing paradigms, every one of your countries is in the midst of that. Um, so if, so paper number one is about the legacy of the West and its effect on the environment. So you can look up various United Nations um, documents about the environment. I'm going to find those and, you know, post them eventually, but I, right now, <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure I'll get to it right when you're writing your papers, so. Um, okay, so the next thing I want to alert you to is that in the next class, for the next class, I did not notice this until recently because of this huge time differential. I am part of a conference. I'm one of the presenters at a conference that's occurring right exactly the same hours as this class is scheduled for. So I'm going to send you the link in right after this class. Um, I'll probably try to cut and paste it, but I don't trust myself. So I'll send you the link and you're required to attend that class. There's nothing to read beforehand. So what you do after is you write a post. And I already have that, your reaction to the conference. Um, then uh, I think you all know that in, right toward the end of the semester, the summer term, there's a huge holiday on the 19th, the 20th, and the 21st of July. That's one day missed for the Sunday and Tuesday classes, but it's two days missed for the Monday and Wednesday. And this week on Friday and Saturday are the makeup days. So we have to do one makeup day this week. Now, given that you don't have to prepare anything for the next class, this would be the time to have the makeup day. Um, there's so few people that come to class that it's very hard to get a vote, right? About which day works better for the students, Friday or Saturday. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, it's your time, Friday or Saturday, right? For me, it's Thursday or whatever. 
Um, so are there any standard reasons that students would prefer Friday rather than Saturday? Do students have religious obligations on one of those days? Um, professor, Friday we can do at the same time. So right. 8 to 11, no problem on that. But after this time, this is like we have religious things and all, the prayer and everything. So we can do from the morning, Professor, at the same time. The same time, it's, it would be the same time, yes? Yeah, that would be fine. So Even well, Thursday for me is what? Well, let me just go into the chat and, and answer my question, yes or no. Does Friday morning work better for you than Saturday? Yes or no? Okay, all of you give me an answer. One yes, two yes. Everybody, come on guys. Three yes, four yes, five yes. Hey, there's more than five people attending this class, I hope. We have 10 participants, Professor, except you nine. Nine students are here. Yeah, well, where are the other four? You know, maybe it's possible their electricity's down. It's possible that <laughs> they left the room and I just caught them. But okay, we're gonna go with Friday, okay? And I will post the assignment. And then of course, then I'll have a YouTube video. But what I'm going to do with the YouTubes is make them so they're not three hours. Just um, what I'm going to do is when the students have their reactions, when they're speaking, not because I don't like listening to you and think it's important, I do, but I think I'll shut it off and then summarize your reactions. Turn the YouTube back on and summarize it. And then the students can let me know if they think I was fair. And that's just so the students who are already behind can only have to spend like two hours maybe or an hour and a half on the YouTube rather than three hours. Does that seem good to you? Why don't you? If you think that's a good idea, could could you just? I'm looking over there in the chat. Professor, I have a question. So already you have the post and then the readings, which is we are supposed to do read, read right? So right. after reading that, if we react on the reading, so would it be fine or is is it necessary to go through the YouTube videos? Um, you know, I wanted you to respond to the other students right oh, but it's getting you know it's getting to be so complicated and so much time but um i think i would like you to go on to at least for an hour just something right um so that you do hear oh, the okay. other students reaction um anyway And also, I suppose on the YouTube, if students need the material to be explained a little bit more. But in general, you can get away with doing it without the YouTube, just so you stay caught up. Um, all right, uh, nobody's really posting, so. So, um, the plan, you come to the conference on Wednesday morning and then you come to class, what, Friday morning, right? And I will post the reading for Friday right after class here. Um, and Professor, that would yeah. be good if you send a reminder email for students who are not here or doesn't don't yeah. know that we have class yeah. on Friday. Yeah, I will definitely send an email. 
Uh, because I am going to send the link to the conference too. Um, so I think I'll do those together. So again, the students don't keep constantly getting emails from me, although I did stop doing that. Um, I know that I did that too much at the beginning and it's just too much data coming in. I understand. I mean, I, I have that problem. Um, all right, so, so what we're doing now for today is Hinduism and Buddhism. And I wanted each of you to give a reaction to your reading on Hinduism. What happened? It's not sharing. Okay. Couldn't preview. Okay. <laughs> Oh, life is going on. Uh, professor, are our posts short from now? Like, it's 350 words. Yep. Okay. All right. So it's not going to work. Um, all right. So I will try another method. I'm sorry uh those of you who haven't read it go read it <laughs> i'm gonna call on you and if you haven't read it that's trouble so i certainly hope you have um oh god um, trying to find the outline here. <laughs> okay. Okay. Just a second. So just be prepared to present. Get, get ready with what you plan to present. Oh my goodness. Okay. Um, Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can try doing this a different way. Um, here we go. All right. So the here are the some of the ideas, hopefully You've all thought about this by now. Um, is do you agree with this that that we need a spiritual dimension of an environmental protection? You can't just bring in science. You have to also bring in people's uh, religion or their their view of good and evil and justice and injustice. Okay, why is it important? Because the materialistic orientation of the West, right? You know what they're talking about now, right? Everybody? Yes, yes, Professor. Yeah, right? It isn't just that Westerners have wealth. It's that what we've read is they believe in it, right? 
they think it's God's will and all that wonderful stuff. So religion provides three fundamental mainstays to cope with technological societies. Do you agree with this or is this reactionary? That's what I'm gonna ask each of you when I finish reading the outline. It defends the individual against depersonalizing effects. It forces individuals to recognize human fallibility and to combine realism with idealism. And it encourages moral strength so that, you know, living sustainably is something they want to do because it gives them moral strength that's consistent with their religious values. And then there's religious religions punish people who violate God's creation. So is it true that environmental education is incomplete without cultural and religious perspectives? So the United Nations has a very complex documents, a number of them about environmental education. Should the UN just, is that enough and leave religion out of it? Or should you bring in things that people identify with, with their religion and their culture? Um, all right. All right. And so he refers back to Lynn White again. This is his, his claim. Hindu religion was respectful of the environment until the West started to influence the culture and the economic development, right? So yes, there is environmental destruction in Hindu countries, but the answer to that, this guy says, well, that's because it's not Hindu anymore. It was undermined. People wanted jobs, right? And the West gave them jobs that involves destroying the environment. And so, okay, they destroy the environment. It doesn't mean that really is consistent with their religious and cultural tradition. It, they might be conflicted about it also. Um, should we appeal to that moving forward, right? And then he talks about the sanctity of life in Hinduism. Um, you're not supposed to inflict damage, the whole idea of positive karma and negative karma, um, our duties to animals and plants. And I think intuitively you should, you can understand this, the doctrine of nonviolence, vegetarianism. Um, and I, I do want you to, um, to think about the difference between this and either Christianity or Islam. Christianity and Islam have a book, right? They're religions of the book, whereas Hinduism and Buddhism are more mystical. They're religions related to a way of life, right? And energy and really maintaining a balance of inner and outer and maintaining karma or in Buddha nirvana. They're much more immediate and much more, I think, connected to the world we live in. It's energy, right? It's not, it's something more or spiritual as opposed to just physical, but it isn't this supernatural God who has this plan for human history and certain people are special in the eyes of God, sons of Abraham. And if you believe well, okay, then you're special too. And, you know, your goal is to act in a way that you're going to go to heaven or hell after death. That seems to me to leave a lot more leeway for exploiting nature and getting away with it, as long as you're a good little boy or girl, whatever that is. Um, you can argue, of course, that God doesn't want you to destroy the creation, but it's not the same as this very immediate feedback of karma or your relatives could have been reincarnated as animals or, you know, the doctrines of reincarnation and karma seem to have a, a, a much <laughs> more um, accountability and the feedback loops are much more immediate than they are in the other two religions. Now, 
I'm not sure. I just want you to entertain, right? I'm not making this claim about that's why one's better than the other. Absolutely. It's just that they really are different worldviews. And so, um, uh, okay. And so the caste system, right? Again, the caste system was designed so that there wasn't competition and destruction in the environment in, you know, in the middle of that competition. But, and his claim was it stopped working. It degenerated when the West came in. Now, of course, I wouldn't advocate for having untouchables or something, but having, you know, ancient traditions of farming and finding ways to feed the people that were sustainable because that was the only way to survive was to make sure not to exploit in an unsustainable way. And so, um, so that was his main claim was that they were very aware of um, the need to maintain sustainability. And then psychologically, they were focusing on how to enable everyone to flourish. But during the British occupation, it, it fell apart. Now, today, there are, there are these defenders of the environment, the tree huggers and the Chipko movement. So 1750, 1973. Um, let's see, there's been this loss of respect. Um, it has and he, you know, he's annoyed by foreign cultural domination, right? India needs a revival of respect for ancient cultural values, not fundamentalism, right? Not um, extreme religiosity that's anti-science or something, but just the basic respect. Um, Gandhi drew upon the, the spiritual heritage. so. So um, these movements should be ecumenical, interfaith, and multicultural. They can also include humanism, of course. Um, so let's see, what was I going to ask you? I guess um, uh, I guess I'll just take reactions from each of you about, oh, yeah. My main point here was that at the moment, as we speak, there's a huge battle going on between a woman named Vandava Shiva, who wrote a book called Earth Democracy. And if you go online, she's got lots of stuff. She, she's from India and she wants, she's got a movement where farmers are tapping into that, those ancient traditions of sustainability. And she's creating sustainable farming. And she, you know, she would be on board with this, that those farming methods work really well. And they will serve to feed the people in India a lot better than bringing in the GMOs and the tractors and the fertilizer and the air pollution and the water pollution. And there's a Pepsi-Cola plant that literally lowers the the water level <laughs> under the ground, you know, they're going to take, end up without enough water. The water table is going down. Um, and she is at war against Bill Gates. Bill Gates is an engineer. He's a Kant type. And he just really thinks the solution is more technology. We can't go backwards. And he called her evil at one point. So the thing is, as an amateur, what really annoys me is that they don't work together because it seems absolutely obvious to me that sometimes it's better to use the traditional methods and sometimes it's better to get technology. And each country and each issue and each development. So that's a judgment call and that would be complex. But when you have these two people 
sitting there and demonizing each other, literally calling each other evil. The rest of us just go, ah, I know this isn't true. And I know everyone's getting hurt by this. You shouldn't be that much at odds because we all have this joint project. But anyway, uh, that's my, my point here is that this old, the Hindu stuff, the Hindu tradition is still playing a big role in huge debates about what we should do moving forward. All right, so each student needs to clock in here and give what stood out to you. Okay, Mosa, what about you? Did you have something? Are you there? Okay, Sristi, did you have something? Yes, Professor. Yes, Go ahead. Professor. Uh, uh, okay, so I think people really fear their religion because when they think of neglecting their religious rules, they also think of getting punished by God. So there's always a fear of karma coming back to people if they did something wrong in some cases of religious people. So as science helps people to understand and analyze everything with logic, religion can also help people to understand things with ethical views. So it, it works better uh, on people to make them realize their mistakes and give a chance to reduce them and stay in their morals. So bringing, bringing the good ethics and sustainability back to people can be possible by working with science and religion both together. Okay, good, very good. All right. Um, all right, Jamie. All right. Yes, my sister. Yes. Did you read it and have a reaction? Are you there? Yes, Professor. Okay, what was your reaction? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> okay. Um, Shazneen. Okay, is your machine broken down? Okay, Rossi? Hi, Dr. Beck. Um, there's actually a case going on in Cambodia right now related to environmental problems. And Buddhism always claimed that animals and humans should be treated equally and with loving kindness. And the, like our government are Buddhist, they claim to be Buddhist, yet they still accuse three young environmentalists in Cambodia, um, Prata, Chu Li Ming and um, another one, Chandra Bhut, who are environmental activists for causing instability in the country. So they are now going to trial with a potential consequences of 20 years of jail for talking out about saving the environment for how, uh, for how Cambodians are harming the environment by putting in, uh, by, um, like putting in the factory water, like the pollutants into the lakes and for how much plastic they're using. And I just find this absurd that they claim to be Buddhist, yet they are accusing environmentalists that they are causing disturbances when in reality, they are the one who should be cautious of their own actions. Yeah, okay. All right. So. I hope the rest of you understand that if we had 18 students and each student, you know, said something about their country or some specific issue, it would be a very interesting class, right? You don't have to listen to me. You know, I don't, that's, 
I just can't get the students to do it. I don't know what's wrong. Um, so I definitely will have to start grading you on whether you come prepared. Now, the problem now is I cannot figure out whose machines are broken down, right? Have electricity problems and who don't. But I, I do want you to come prepared from now on so that we can have meaningful discussions. Um, two, are you, did you come prepared? Yes, Professor, I did. Good. Uh, yeah, Professor, at the previous early, uh, I couldn't ever to listen to your lectures about this article because I got disconnected. I just joined again. And well, go ahead, whatever you came with what did you yes the professor i i really like the way that the hinduism uh they address the environment the issue in their uh religions like uh, they treat all the creatures and all the living things as equal as a uh, human no one is above uh all the creatures and all other things in the universe i and also I wish, uh, actually I'm a Christian, so, um, I wish to address this kind of environmental issue in uh, uh, like every religion also, as well in Christian also. And also I was, when, when I'm reading this article, I was wondering, is there any uh, separation or something that we can use or we can consume from the nature? because it mentioned that all are equal and we have to respect and every tree has its own, it, uh, it has God. Uh, so I'm wondering in the universe, we, uh, we have to consume and we have to use to, uh, for our surviving. So I'm wondering, what can, is there any, in Hinduism, is there any separation or something like that? Yeah, I, I was wondering that. And also I, I Another thing that I, I want to know, I wondering is that who designed the caste system? Like they mentioned that uh, because we have uh, limited uh, nature resources, we have to uh, practice and consume the natures uh, due to the lack of nature resources. So they uh, separate the caste, the class system, like who cons uh, their obligation and their set the boundaries. So who did that? I mean, uh, who, who, uh, because it is saying that all are equal, right? But who, who set that boundary? Who should be consumed this boundary? Who should be do this? Yeah, right. I, kind of I think Hindu, uh, Hinduism, the culture in India is so old, right? That that just gradually evolved that way. Um, as people were meeting their needs, they, out how to do it sustainably and how you know there's definitely jobs that need doing right and so they started to divide according to who was good at which job but that became um rigid right in theory you know there should be some mobility between the castes um but it became rigid and um, that, that's the downside of it, right? The US is the land of opportunity. People can work and move themselves up economically. Um, but then the US people are competitive and adversarial and materialistic and very destructive of the environment also. So the caste system, so Vandava Shiva, wants to bring back just those practices of sustainability, but not the caste system, right? So everybody is, is farming at a sustainable level and there's no lower caste or, uh, you know, second lowest caste doing this. It's sort of uh, farming is a respectable profession and you can have a decent life as a farmer. And also not by, by farming in a way that's sustainable. 
so that you have stability in your life and you have, you can assume that you're going to be able to have a decent life, your children will. But because of the exploitation with science and industry and technology, uh, people in India, you know, they're, they're aiming for a higher level of standard of living, but it's a lot less secure because disasters happen, right? And erosion or now there's climate instability and things. So I think that's what she's getting at is that in the long run, everybody will have a more stable way of life and um, they, and there's no need for a huge gap between the rich and the poor like there used to be. Does that answer your question? Is that okay too? Yes, it's okay, Melissa. The other thing was, what did you think of the Patrick Dobell's view of stewardship of the earth? As a Christian, right? So Dobal was the Christian and he he just used Bible quotes to justify this concept of stewardship. And so, you know, what I want you to think about is comparing and contrasting these different views. And then should we keep religion out of it or is religion an important part? Um, how does the UN, how much should the UN just work on its sustainability issues or the millennial goals? Those are um, humanists, basically, like the Bill and Melinda Gates and um, Mackenzie Scott and these people, these billionaires who give money away, are humanists. But to what extent should they give money to organizations that are religiously based? And to what extent should they avoid religion and just go with secular stuff? I don't know, those are open questions, but um, that's what I'm hoping that my students will educate me about in each of their countries, because each country is probably different and there's different examples going on. There's just so much stuff going on around the world right now in terms of trying to change the paradigms. Um, so, so Khadija, did you read the assignment and come up with some idea? So, okay. <laughs> so Khadija does have network issues a lot. So I'm going to assume that's the problem. Um, Shazneen, are you there at all? Okay. Let's see, is there anybody else who came prepared and I haven't called on you and your machine is working? Um, all right, so let's go to um, Buddhism then. So the Buddhist attitude is, um, it's about suffering, way of life intended to eradicate suffering. The cause of suffering is desire, excess desire. And the cure for suffering is to be released from desire and um, follow the Eightfold Path. But, the, but really, the idea is to live a very simple life. Nature is dynamic and changeable. And so, you know, you shouldn't cling to any material things because they're, they don't last, they're transient. Um, there's cycles of evolution and, and dissolution. Natural processes are affected by human morality. There's natural laws or forces. I mean, I, I like this stuff. So physical forces, biological forces, psychological forces, moral 
people acting on their good and evil, uh, ideas of good and evil, and then causal. So there's causes at all these different levels. And the goal is to get all of this stuff to work in harmony, right? To be balanced out in a reciprocal causal relationship, mutual inter interaction. Um, so the, the world, nature and humankind stands or falls with the type of moral force at work. So greed leads to famine. And this is, you know, it's very ironic, but it's true, <laughs> right? Ignorance leads to an epidemic. Hatred leads to violence. Moral degeneration leads to a few people who pick up the pieces and create a moral regeneration. So um, in this time of climate change and extreme climate, would it be good to have a religion that, you know, the basis of it is when things get bad, then there's this reversal that takes place and it can regenerate. In Hinduism, when things get bad, the, the Godhead comes to earth in some form to try and bring it back. And, you know, in Christianity, Jesus came to try and bring things back, uh, heading in the right direction. So a lot of those religions do have an idea of how to regenerate. But even scientists, so this is another way that science and religion come together, is that, um, I mean, we either are going to change or we're going to die, right? We don't, there's... Either we're going to destroy life on earth or we're going to have a radical shift, a paradigm shift. And um, I think, you know, you can use religion and science together is my personal view. But again, I don't want to tell my students what to think and they will have their own reasons, right? Given their experience, they might think, no, don't bring religion in. Everybody I know who's religious will be anti-science. So you just have to, um, yeah, do what? Like, <laughs> those are the people, if you don't appeal to religion, the, the behavior won't change. So uh, it makes more sense to me that you would take from every possible um, area of culture to try and change the paradigm, it's such a radical shift that whatever you can take from the past to make people feel comfortable, but also motivated to make this huge shift, the better off will, you know, the more likely that you will succeed. Um, people have to understand nature to be able to utilize natural resources. So science is okay as long as it has the right goal. Um, and it's just that the idea here is that evil makes everybody miserable and contentment, simple life, um, loving kindness, um, equ equanimity, okay? Treating people as equal, treating nature and humans as, as equal as possible, just in, in general, a very non-aggressive attitude. So the Buddhist monks, right? Um, the five precepts, you abstain from any injury to life. Buddhist monks avoid even unintentional, unintentional harm to life. They don't want to harm worms or ants or anything. Um, all right. And the monks, right? Um, Monastic rules prevent them from injuring even plant life unnecessarily. So of course, we have to eat something. <laughs> but I think in general, you can engage in farming in a way that's more violent and harmful and in a way that's more um, helpful or more uh, less aggressive. Uh, less wicked, less violent. Um, I don't know how much you know about factory farms and 
I hope you don't have them in your countries, but they are really violent toward the animals. Um, the animals can be put in cages. Uh, young lambs, for example, are put in these cages where they can't even turn around. They can't turn their neck and they have a natural drive to clean themselves. And uh, it's just the way these animals are treated is so disgusting. Um, and they're fed, you know, just factory food and they're slaughtered under horrible conditions. And the working conditions of the people that work in these places is horrible. The pay is horrible. All of that, you know, is bad karma, all of it. Um, there's a chicken factory in my town, or my, <laughs> I moved away, thank goodness, but um, just this, the state of Arkansas had so many abuses to the natural world and so many billionaire rich people. It was just really sad. Um, so to what extent do we need to figure out, you know, how to bring back some of these ancient religions, right? Christianity is a very, a relatively young religion. Islam is even younger. Um, but Hinduism is an ancient religion and then Buddhism branched off of it. But the meritorious deed, okay. So in theory anyway, leaders. Now this is where Rossi says that's not really what's going on, right, Rossi? And then, um, so what did you think, Rossi, when you're reading this and then you know about what's going on in your country? What do you think? It's you just like insane that, um, for me personally, I just think that it's insane that Buddhism has all of these um, doctrines and mentalities on saving the environment and stuff, yet people are so like not following it, you know? Um, people will talk about cleaning up after themselves, talking about planting trees but I have seen cases that this is not happening and one more thing that I've noticed is the crazy fast um what do you call it fast fashion where people keep buying like the latest trends to fit in and I used to sell clothes so I know what that is like people will change clothes and trends every few months and so piles of clothes will be left to no use and then they'll ended up being dumped in landfills and then this is just suffocating the environment and the people's attitude towards pollution like they don't care about anything it's just heartbreaking when they claim to be buddhist yet uh, buddhism doesn't teach them to do like that yeah, and that's where, right, the legacy of the West, right, the notion of pleasure, pain, and happiness has gotten associated with consumption. Does that make sense, Rossi? Yes. Okay, so that's what I, you know, when I taught this class back on campus, it was, you know, the students were really starting to get this, right? because they were raised in these different religious traditions. And it's intuitively obvious, right? That you're not supposed to be greedy and you're not supposed to be proud and you're not supposed to destroy God's creation or you're not supposed to create bad karma. And then they thought about things like what you're saying about fast clothes or one student, um, well, they started, you know, sort of repenting, <laughs> realizing that, that they'd gotten brainwashed and that they had associated happiness with consumption and, and they were changing their minds because their countries are so deeply affected by um, climate change. 
I was actually shocked that they had bought into this stuff because I really thought students from Bangladesh, wow, they're going to be raving environmentalists because of their countries falling apart. Uh, but, you know, they weren't, especially I thought the educated ones, you know, the ones at a liberal arts school, but that's okay. I think by the end of the class, I think they had changed their minds and they wanted to change their habits. It's then it's just a matter of habit. And then if you're in college, you can change your habits. Um, but also it's a way to get inner peace. I mean, obviously students are under stress and it's one thing to try Buddhist meditation as just a way to get over your personal stress, right? So you feel happier and more pleasure and less pain uh, but it's quite another thing to just think, you know, I want to go back to my cultural tradition. I want to respect that tradition and to sort of make um, living sustainable, sustainably, like part of who I am and part of who my country is. And it's not just learning meditation techniques so you can sort of blow your mind. It's learning, you know, karma, positive karma in every aspect of your life and learning to take pleasure in that and learning to get uh, inner peace from that, not from meditation techniques. Does that make sense, Rossi? Because, you know, people have measured you know, when you go into this meditation, yes, you can put these things on your head and measure that, yes, it does make you feel more peaceful, but, but, you know, then you go off and live your high consumption lifestyle, and then you get your meditation technique, and you can sort of buzz out with your brain, or is it just, you know, a way of life, and a culture, and you want to be proud of your culture, and you want to think that, gee, Buddhism is cutting edge and I want to, you know, I want to be at the forefront of changing the paradigm without throwing away my cultural tradition. I just want to tell my people that it's a great tradition and we should see ourselves as at the forefront of the next 50 years, not a backward country that has to try to consume more and be more like the West. Does that make sense, Rossi? Yes, Dr. Berg. Have you thought about that before? Actually, not really. Like, I honestly, when I think about Buddhism, I just think about karma and think about pagodas where people go to pray besides that i never think about the meditation like i know my grandma does it all the time and stuff but i don't really focus on like its purpose and stuff so it's really great to get a chance to know more of like what buddhism is all about and its connection like it's deeper connection to um, our life and to the environment. Like I don't consider myself religious, yet I still like follow certain teachings from Buddhism because I feel like it's a crucial part to help me stay on track and to help like somehow cultivate my environmentalist um, like passion, I guess. Okay, good. Well, I, th I think I'm going to call on each of you to just, you know, if you have to brainstorm on your feet or something, but just to have some reaction, because now we've read Christianity, we've read Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism. So if you come from a different tradition than that, that's fine. You can just explain that. But I just want each of you to say something about if you've thought about that tradition in relation to environmental issues and do you, the people around you think about that tradition in relationship to 
their uh, treatment of the environment. So I'm just gonna go around to everybody who's left. Let's see. Um, let me stop the screen share here and see if we can sort of talk to each other, even if, <laughs> oh, this is harder, but so Jamie, what is your tradition? Did you get raised in one of these religious traditions? Okay, Shazneen, are you there? That's odd because I know Shazneen is a very good student, so she must be having trouble with her internet. Is it raining in Bangladesh? Anybody know? Yes, Professor. It's it, really bad weather here and the network is not good at all. Okay, so that must be it because I, again, I trust the students and I know that they're good students. So um, I might just stop. I think I'll stop the class early because again, I don't want the people who have to go look at the YouTube video, they don't have to spend, you know, the whole three hours. But, um, okay, oh, so Shazneen says her microphone isn't working because I'm using a borrowed laptop. I knew it was something, Shazneen, <laughs> right? I knew it was something. Um, so just a sec, Mosa, do you have anything? Are you there? Yes, Professor, I'm hearing you. <laughs> So okay, what is, is okay? Sorry. What's your background? So I belongs to Islam religion. Um, so there, I'm Muslim, and there are certain you know cultures, in, particularly in Islam. For example, there are five pillars. So we have to pray five times in a day, and then you need to give zakat. Zakat means like if you are oldie. You have to give money to poor people in in the society, and then uh, fasting during during Ramadan, so like thirty days or twenty something like yeah, that one. And also, if you have a lot of money, you can go for Hajj in Makkah. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> these are the things we have, and also there is one one more like faith, only faith in Allah. And these are, yeah, these are the pillars of Islam, and these are cultivated in our, you know, religion. Yeah, but do you think, yeah, do you think most Muslims think of the five pillars, but they don't connect that to environmental? Oh, sorry, Professor, could you repeat that? Well, it seems to me you think of yourself as a very faithful Muslim without having any concern for environmental problems. Oh, you're talking about myself? Okay. No, I, well, I'm just, well, you, but also just in general, you can pray five times a day, give money away, you can fast, you go on a pilgrimage, believe in God, but not make any connection between that and sustainability. Like, you know, in Saudi Arabia, you can do all that stuff and be an oil billionaire, right? No problem. Yeah. Actually, a professor, I'm not getting your questions. Okay, what I understood from your question is that, so these are the, you know, as you're asking about the culture of Muslim, I'm just saying the basic things as a Muslim was supposed to do, but there's a lot of connection to the, you know, um, environment, for example, like these are the, some other thing. Uh, for example, like we are not obligated to destroy any, you know, uh, uh, like, sorry. So we're, we're not supposed to uh, destroy the nature by ourselves. So this is a lot of things in mention, but people are not following that professor. People are doing that for their own pleasure and <laughs> making money and becoming wealthy. These are the things, but we are not supposed to do that. Do you think most Muslims, um, as the environment deteriorates, more likely to promote sustainability in the name of their religion? 
or do you um, yes professor but uh i'm if i say that most muslim that could be you know i don't know um, I, I can't say like that way but i could say you know people who are you know in power who has political power religious power you know like a, uh, a scholar so these are the people for their own advantages they can do this kind of things but uh muslims who belongs to you know middle class and poverty they're more concerned about the religion they're more you know uh, uh like uh, following the religion but on the other hand political people and then other people who have a lot of money all the people so for their own advantages they can do that they are doing that actually yeah and okay. they and they themselves they themselves you know claim that okay they are muslim but muslim doesn't behave that way okay um all right so i do want you to um you know write your own view of where do we go moving forward right so the first paper is just on the legacy of the west and where you want to take yourself your country moving forward right yes, um sir. So I understand that none of us have that much power, but on the other hand, everything we do matters, at least some. And it also matters in the sense that however you live, you live that way because you desire it and you're going to start deceiving yourselves or lying to yourself. You're just gonna start living a lie if you don't develop good habits. Does that make sense? Yes, please. You just become conflicted. So I think for your own well-being and your own integrity, you should work out your positions that you should really think about, you know, how do I want to think about this moving forward? Um, and I don't advocate that you would cripple yourself professionally just because you have to fly in an airplane to have a job but on the other hand you definitely shouldn't just say it doesn't matter or resist change just because you have to fly in an airplane for your job you know that's what I see in America I can't believe it you know so many people's jobs require a lot of fossil fuels but that doesn't mean you have to believe in it or you have to deny climate change. You just have to say, I, I want the economy to change so I can have this job without having that carbon footprint, right? Does, does that make sense to all of you, to you, Mosa? Yes, Professor, I'm listening. Okay. Um, so I do think it matters. I, just for your own, <laughs> just for your own integrity and, for you to um, communicate with other people because something has to change and somebody's sort of got to be in the forefront. Um, but if all of you who have something to say have said what you have to say, I'm going to let you go because it's half an hour before the class technically ends, which means you all have half an hour. And I want you to take that half an hour and get those posts, right? Polish up some posts and get them put on the machine and get caught up um, so that you can move on. So you don't feel overwhelmed by this class. So I will let you go and I will stay here. And I hope, I mean, I can't promise me. <laughs> that you'll do my class for half an hour so that you can get caught up and you aren't freaked out by my class. Okay. Professor. Yep. I have a concern. So as you are giving us 30 minutes to post, it, post that, right? So um, I think I can do that. I'm not in a position to do. Can I do it by today? If sure, possible. I mean, I'm just waiting that there are posts for whom there have been three students out of 18 that have actually posted, you know? I mean, many students are way behind. Right, uh, I'm also way behind professors, far away. 
but do you feel empowered at this point that you can do it? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Okay. So I'm going to do that. I have to, Professor. I mean, do you feel like this class helped you get a grip? Right, yes, Professor, of course. Okay, that's my goal, my absolute goal. And it reduces my fear and it's scary, you know, because the last time I thought, oh my God, I have a lot of assignment to do. And I am your two of our classes, so I was unable to do any of them. So that, that was my biggest headache, you know. I At the same time, I was sick. I was thinking, okay, well, where to start and how to finish it and how to finish it. So long away, long way. So that's why, Professor, okay. Inshallah, I'm going to do that by today. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I'm not going to be able to get them all read, but real quickly, because I hope I just get bombarded with stuff at this point. So, okay, I'm going to let you go, but I'm sending the link. You must come to the conference on Wednesday. It's called The Meaning of Cultural and Religious Identity in the Pluralistic and Globalized World. And it has scholars from all over the world. And I think you'll enjoy it. So. Yeah. Um, Professor, if when everyone leaves, I want to talk to you. Is it fine? Can I have five more minutes? Sure. I'll just, everyone who is ready to go, go. Go do some homework for my class. And Mosa can stay. And if anybody else wants to talk to me, I'm here. Thank you, Professor Beck. Take care. So, Srisi, do you feel like you can catch up at this point? Uh, yes, Professor. I actually caught up uh, almost all of the posts due uh, this week. So, yes. I, yeah, yeah. So, I yeah, have I have been reading your stuff and I know that you're doing a good job. So, good for you. Uh, thank you, Professor. So there's like the new posts are left, so I will be working on them. Okay, you don't feel overwhelmed though. You feel like you got a grip. Uh, yeah, I, I well, think that's so. good. And Professor, thank you like for this classes when you give us time to write after discussing the points. So this really helps like before I had to sit for like four hours, five hours and complete one post, but then now it's like one or two hours I can do. Everything. Good, good. Thank you, I, Professor. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for hanging in there. Thank you, bye, Professor. Bye-bye.